All right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, we are going to look at a new sutta. Tonight, uh, we're still going to be in the middle-length discourses, the Majima Nikaya. Tonight, we're going to start with sutta number 45, which is the Chula Dhamma Samadana Sutta, <laughs> the shorter discourse on ways of taking up the Dharma. The shorter discourse on ways of practicing could be another way. Um, but really quickly, this is another one of those suttas, a lot like the last few weeks, where there's a shorter version and a longer version, but they're not the same sutta. They're not the same, you know, sutra, just a short version, long version. They're always sort of two very different teachings. Tonight, we're going to look at the, the little one, but we might even look at the big one, too. I might actually do both of these together. But, you know, let's see how the evening goes. Um, yeah, I mean, let's just dive right in. Uh, let's start, as usual, with the title. So, you know, this is either the Chula, the shorter, or the Maha, the greater, and then the sutta is called the Dhamma Samadana Sutta. Now, Dhamma is the Pali pronunciation of Dharma, right? Sanskrit's that harder Dharma. So we're talking about the Dharma, but what about the Dharma? <laughs> well, we're talking about Samadana. Now, the root of this word, Samadana, the root of it is Adana. And then if you wanted to get real technical, the root of that is dana, which is our sort of giving. But this is adana. And you know a word, you probably know a word that's related to this, which is upadana. So adana is like, it's kind of like taking up adana. And then if you were to samadana, that's different than upadana. Upadana is like grabbing and holding. So taking up, but in a very forceful, appropriating way. But this word tonight, samadana, sam means, you know, the same as or in accord with. And so the basic idea of this is about samadana, taking up, being in accord with the Dharma, the Dhamma. And basically what the sutta is about, let me just give you kind of a, a little uh, summary. The Buddha is about to explain four different ways of practicing. It's a pretty simple sutta in that way. Both of them, by the way, deal with this topic, which are the four ways of practice, <clears throat> the four ways of taking up the Dharma. So let's dive in. So sutta number 45, the Chula Dhamma Samadana Sutta, starts in classic fashion. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Bintika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. And the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, there are four ways of undertaking things or of taking up the Dharma. What are the four? There's a way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. There's a way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. There's a way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. And there's a way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future 
as pleasant. And what, bhikkhus, is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain? Bhikkhus. There are certain recluses and certain Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. There's no harm in sensual pleasures. And they take to gulping down sensual pleasures, and they divert themselves with women wanderers who wear their hair bound in a top knot. They say this. What future fear do these good recluses and Brahmins see in sensual pleasures when they speak of abandoning sensual pleasures and describe the full understanding of sensual pleasures? Pleasant is the touch of this woman wanderer's tender, soft, downy arm. Thus they take to gulping down sensual pleasures, and having done so, on the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. There they feel painful, racking, piercing feelings. They say thus, This is the future fear those good recluses and Brahmins saw in sensual pleasures when they spoke of abandoning sensual pleasures and described the full understanding of sensual pleasures. For it is, for it is by reason of sensual pleasures, owing to sensual pleasures, that we are now feeling such painful, racking, piercing feelings. Bhikkhus. Suppose that in the last month of the hot season, a maluva creeper, just one sec. Yep. So suppose in the last months of the hot season, a maluva creeper pod burst open and a maluva creeper seed fell at the foot of a sala tree. Then a deity living in that tree became fearful, perturbed, and frightened. But the deity's friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives, you know, garden deities, park deities, tree deities, and deities in happening medicinal herbs, grass and forest monarch trees, they all gathered together and reassured the deity in the sala tree thus. Have no fear, sir. Have no fear. Perhaps a peacock will swallow the maluva creeper seed or a wild animal will eat it, or a forest fire will burn it up, or woodsmen will carry it off, or white ants will devour it, or it might not even be fertile. But no peacock swallowed that seed. No wild animal ate it. No forest fire burned it. No woodsmen carried it off. No white ants devoured it. And it was in fact fertile. Then, being moistened by rain from a rain-bearing cloud, the seed in due course sprouted, and the maluva creeper's tender, soft, downy tendril wound itself around the solitary. Then the deity living in the solitary had this thought. What future fear did my friends and companions, my kinsmen and relatives, see in that maluva creeper seed? when they gathered together and reassured me as they did. Pleasant is the touch of this maluva creeper's tender, soft, downy tendril. But then the creeper enfolded the sala tree, made a canopy over it, draped a curtain all around it, and split the main branches of the tree. The deity who lived in the tree then realized, ah, this is the future fear they saw in that maluva creeper seed. Because of that maluva creeper seed, I am now feeling painful, racking, piercing feelings. So too, bhikkhus, 
there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. There's no harm in sensual pleasures. They say this. This is the future fear those good recluses and Brahmins saw in sensual pleasures, that we are now feeling such painful, racking, piercing feelings. And this is called the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. All right, let's pause there for a moment. Questions about this idea. The only thing that I would want to throw in there, just in case, is that if you are not into this idea of the hell realms or perdition, or even the idea of like a future rebirth, you don't really need to look that far, right? Because the Buddha is talking about that there's sort of one view, one way of being in the world that doesn't see any problem with indulging in sensual pleasures. But then, of course, the idea is, is that if you take, you know, take a sensual pleasure that Buddhism is often talking about, uh, intoxication is one that comes to mind. Classic example of some a practice or at least an activity, I suppose, that is pleasant in that way, perhaps when it's happening. But over enough time, <laughs> there's the development of diseases, there's the destruction of family, there's the destruction of health, there's all kinds of things that eventually kind of come about from indulging in that particular thing. So you could kind of look at it like that, that this isn't about rebirth. It's about in the future and sort of short-sightedness and the things that might be pleasurable now, but short-sightedness doesn't see that they result in pain in the future. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. Just wanted to make sure we were on the same page in case anybody didn't you know, care about hell. It doesn't matter in that way, right? The ICU is hell enough in that way. So, okay. So now let's find out about another way of taking up the Dharma or another way of being in the world. And what bhikkhus is the way of undertaking things that's painful now and ripens in the future as pain? Here, bhikkhus, we're going to have to go back to sutta number 12 in order to get the full breakdown of this. And by the way, sutta number 12 is a sutta I didn't cover. I didn't do this one. I'm kind of a little regretful that I didn't cover this one back when we were kind of going through those chapters. So this is in a section of the, uh, It's this is the greater discourse on the lion's roar, sutta number 12. And there's a section in there that's called the Bodhisattva's Austerities. And this is kind of a famous section because it gets kind of extracted and quoted a lot. And what it is, is it's a description that the Buddha gives of his years of practice as an ascetic. Before becoming a Buddha, before discovering the middle way, before Buddhism, when the Buddha was a wandering ascetic, and so the sutta that we're reading is about to quote this section in full. So he says, here bhikkhus, someone goes around naked, rejecting conventions, licking their hands, not coming when asked, not stopping when asked, not accepting food, brought or food especially made or not accepting an invitation for a meal, not receiving nothing from a pot, receiving nothing from a bowl, nothing from across a threshold, nothing from a stick, nothing from across a pestle, receiving nothing from two people eating together, not from a pregnant woman, not from a woman giving suckle to a baby, not from a woman in the middle of men, not from where food is advertised to be distributed, not from where a dog is waiting, not from where flies are buzzing, 
not accepting fish, not accepting meat, not drinking liquor, wine, or fermented brew, keeping to one house and to one morsel, or keeping to two houses and two morsels, or keeping to seven houses and just seven morsels, living on a saucer full of food a day, on two saucerfuls a day, or on seven saucerfuls a day, taking food only once a day, only once every two days, taking food only once every seven days, thus even up to only once every two weeks, dwelling pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals, eating only greens or millet or wild rice or hide pairings or moss or rice bran or rice scum or cesium flour or grass or cow dung, living on the forest roots, living only on forest roots and fruit, eating only fallen fruit, clothing oneself only in hemp, in hemp mixed cloth, in shrouds, in refuge rags, in tree bark, in antelope hides, in strips of antelope hide, in kusala grass fabric, in bark fabric, in wood shaving fabric, in head hair wool, in animal wool, or in owl's wings, or pulling out one's hair and beard, pursuing the practice of pulling out your hair and beard, or standing continuously, rejecting seats, or squatting continuously, devoted to maintaining a squatting position, or using a mattress of spikes, or using a mattress of spikes as a bed, dwelling, pursuing the practice of bathing in water three times daily, including in the evening. And I believe that's all of those. They dwell pursuing the practice of bathing in water three times daily, including the evening. Thus, in such a variety of ways, one dwells pursuing the practice of tormenting and mortifying the body. On the dissolution of the body after death, one reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. This is called the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. <laughs> now, of course, that's a, you know, a classic description of the type of austerities that were going on in the forests of India at the time of the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha is said to have practiced all of those, but... If you were to ask me, I think I think it's more of a, a report about everything that's going on in the forest and all the different approaches that people are taking to this. So, you know, take that however. So those are our first two ways of taking things up. Pleasant, but ultimately painful, or painful now and painful and later on. Everybody doing okay with those? Well, and what bhikkhus is the way of undertaking things that's pleasant now? Oh, wait, sorry. And what bhikkhus is the way of undertaking things that's painful now, but ripens in the future as pleasure? Ah. Well, here, bhikkhus, someone by nature has strong desire or lust, or attraction, raga. And they constantly experience pain and grief born of raga. By nature, they have strong dvesha, aversion, or hatred. And they are constantly experiencing pain and grief born of hatred. By nature, they have strong delusion, moha. And they constantly experience pain and grief born of delusion. Yet, in pain and grief, weeping with tearful face, they lead the perfect, pure, holy life. On the dissolution of the body after death, 
they reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. This is the call, this is called the way of undertaking things that's painful now, but ripens in the future as pleasure. All right, so this to me sounds like somebody who takes up the Dharma, takes up the practice of Buddhism, but it's tough. <laughs> it's like they have desire, they have anger, they have delusion, and not satisfying that desire, not acting on that hatred, and not acting delusional is difficult. It's hard. It's not pleasant. But in the future, that practice ripens in pleasure. Again, you know, I could use the example of like basically giving up alcohol. But let's say you really loved it. And let's say your whole kind of life or your social life was really wrapped around it. The idea would be that giving it up might be hard. It might be uncomfortable. It might be not what you want to do in that way. But 10 years down the line, the idea is, is you will be much happier, much more pleased in that way. That's one way of interpreting this. There's many, many ways, of course. But now let's get to the fourth and final way of taking things up. And what bhikkhus is the way of undertaking things that's pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasant? Here, bhikkhus, someone by nature does not have strong lust or attraction. And they don't constantly experience pain and grief born of lust. By nature, they don't have strong hate. And they don't constantly experience pain and grief born of hate. By nature, they don't have strong delusion. And they do not constantly experience pain and grief born of delusion. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, they enter upon and abide in the first jhana. And of course, this is where the sutta would normally walk us all the way through the jhanas, but it is paraphrased, and I'm going to paraphrase it. But then with the stilling, of vitarka and vichaya, so with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, one enters upon and abides in the second jhana. And then with the fading away as well of rapture, one enters upon and abides in the third jhana. And with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, one enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. Upon the dissolution of the body, after death, one reappears in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. This is called the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. These bhikkhus are the four ways of undertaking things. This is what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Okay, so I think we will do the longer version because there's more. There's interesting things in there that I want to talk about, but I want to make sure we're kind of, you know, on solid ground regarding these four approaches to taking up the Dharma in that way. So this is a teaching that you find, you know, you find a lot throughout the Pali Canon. And it's, if I could summarize it, it's this really, really, I think it's a really important idea, but it's a really interesting idea about Buddhism. And the Buddha is always saying that what he's teaching, the results of it are here and now. Other people are going to teach you things where they're going to tell you that down the road, later on, in your next birth, it'll be better. The Buddha says, but what I'm teaching is effective right here and right now. And so that's where 
you know, you get this kind of contrast between these four different ways of, well, again, there's sort of four different approaches to life, frankly, in that way. And so what I like about this teaching is it's sort of like, it seems so simple in that way, in terms of like, you know, hedonistic maximizing of pleasure that kind of doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> and then a kind of weird self-mortifying, you know, austerity that really doesn't go anywhere. And then this these, these other two options of practice the Dharma, practice Buddhism, but it might be tough, but it will be rewarded in the end, sort of. Or this sort of like the real practice of the Dharma, which is pleasant now and leads to pleasure. There's almost a way that where it's like when the Buddha puts it this way, the choice is obvious. Or at least the choice seems obvious to me in that way of like what to do in that sense. But just wanted to kind of, you know, I really wanted to share this sutta, actually both suttas for this reason, for this like, um, I don't know, I wouldn't call it like a selling point because I'm not trying to sell you Buddhism in that way. But it's one of those things where, you know, you, you look at some other religious traditions. I'm not going to name any names. But you look at some other religious traditions that are sort of teaching this kind of like, well, grin and bear it now. And later on, it'll be better in that way. Or all kinds of things. But this particular Buddhist teaching, which is like, no, no, no. If you cultivate this, it's pleasant while it's happening. <laughs> And it actually keeps making things better to the point where it results in pleasure. So again, for me, it's sort of like an easy choice when the Buddha puts it this way. So any questions before we move to, yeah, no. Um, I'm a little, uh, not confused, but I would like some clarifications about number three and four. Numbers one and two seem like, like I thought he's like, oh, he's going for the middle way here, you know, because it was like extreme sensuality, sensual pleasure, then extreme austerity. It's like, no, neither of those is great. But number three, to to let's supposing I read number three and then I was like, yeah, well, that that's, you know, that's kind of what a lot of my teachers are telling me to do. That's a lot, that's a lot of what the Buddha seems to be saying a lot of the time. And then number four, like, oh, that sounds so much better. Why don't I do that? But then the question is how? Like what, mm. is, it, is it really two different paths or is it like a, that, you know, working, I mean, from what I know of the jhanas, there's, uh, you know, you, you, want to be a pretty pretty clear with your with your uh you know um what's the word you you want to live a pretty good life you know you don't want to be you can't be lying and get into jhanas you can't be you know and and then you also need to have good concentration right so it's, it's almost like that's like another step in the path but i, I would love clarification mm -hmm. So I think the key, the key to answering that gnome, it's it's in the language, or at least you know my answer is just coming from the language of the sutta, and it's about that with option number three, as we're calling it in that way, it's about this idea that someone by nature is very lustful, let's say, like you know just big libido in that sense, or like big anger or big ego. And I think the way that I read this is that it's not exactly like a choice, like the way that you put it. And I hear that you put it that way because I presented it that way. But I don't think it's like a choice where it's like, should I do number three where it's really hard, but then good? Or should I do number four where it's good and good? 
it, I think the Buddha is talking about somebody's sort of like disposition going into this and that there's basically the disposition that is still very wrapped up in it. And for that person, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be pleasurable, but the payoff is pleasurable. Whereas if somebody is already sort of like, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, you've met those people. Certainly you've met them if you, if you move in Dharma circles, but you meet people who are sort of naturally drawn to seclusion, sort of naturally drawn to the spiritual life or just naturally drawn to a lot of these things. But that type of a person might live in a culture or a society that's telling them, no, 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 you got to get rich. No, 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 you got to reproduce. No, 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 you got to do all these things. And so that person who doesn't have a lot of lust, doesn't have a lot of anger, doesn't have a lot of delusion, but they're still in this kind of topsy-turvy world that's telling them, no, no, you should have lust. You should, you know, uh, righteous indignation and anger is good. You should do that. And so that person's like, well, I don't know what to do. But then the Buddha says, well, no, it's good to be in seclusion. And then when that person goes into seclusion, they're joyful. They're like, wait, you mean you can do this? You can really just like check out? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you can. You can really, and I don't mean check out responsive. I mean, check out responsibly, not check out from your responsibilities. But that idea of like, oh, you mean I can just be? Yeah, you can just be. That's the person who's going to find pleasure in seclusion. And then even more pleasure in the jhanas once they are given, you know, instruction on how to access them. And so now their cultivation is total pleasure and it leads to pleasure. But again, Noam, I think it's about a, a disposition and it's not a cho choice number three or choice number four. Does that make, yeah. No, yeah. and then, no, yeah, Just, I see. Yeah, I don't, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, and I think I was kind of asking whether this was being presented as a choice or not. So I appreciate your answer. And I think, I don't know. I think I, I think maybe there is more of a choice. You know, I think it it has to I think it can have to do with, you know, practice and the approach to practice. It's to me it's almost like a you know, like th this idea that we're already free, we just have to like let go of it. <laughs> to realize it. yeah, I don't know. It, I I don't want to mince words. I'm not mincing words, but I'm yep. wondering about it. It's it's very interesting to me. Thank yeah, you. no. And by the way, I I did have like a follow up to your your comment. And what it is is that I think what's because you had mentioned that there are some Dharma teachers you know that are sort of pushing option number three in a way. And when I said you know that there's other religions out there that are also sort of pushing option number three, which is again the more be austere, but it'll pay off. And the thing about that is, is that if you think of like, you know, Christian piety, or if you think of those kind of traditions that are trying to instill this kind of like, you know, be moral, be upright, be righteous. But even if it's being taught in this kind of uh, austere way, the point is, is that what those traditions are teaching do lead to better lives. Meaning if you are moral under any auspices, it will lead to a better life for you. So I just wanted to acknowledge that number three is a totally viable option in that way and is promoted out there. But again, for me, and you've heard me say this before, which is for me, you can approach Buddhism as a kind of you know, a thou shalt not kill, steal, or lie, you can approach it that way, and then it'll be a little more austere. Or you can approach it as a wisdom tradition. And there, all of a sudden, it's actually about being like, oh, that's right. It's not wise to be violent. 
And it, it's like clear in your mind how it's just actually not wise to be that way. And that approach then can more quickly lead to the jhanas and things because you're a little like, oh yeah, I don't want any of this stuff anyways. <laughs> so, yeah, Noe. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, going back to the the Brahmins of Sala, <laughs> where he answers this because they're like, well, these gods and this god, and you know, and at some point I will have this. At some point I will have that. And his reply to the householder: If householders who once observed conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct, should wish, oh, by oh, that by realizing myself with direct knowledge. I might here and now enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and the deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taint. It is possible that by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge, they will here and now enter upon and abide in the deliverance of the mind and the deliverance of by wisdom that are tainted with the destruction of the taint. That is why, because... They mm -hmm. observe conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. I love that. I quoted that in my page because it's that moment of pause. It's that moment of when, when I'm confronted with a, a, a thought or an idea of, I have a moment to pause. And, well, I know what I used to do mm -hmm. <laughs> I used to get into fist fight. I used to get into fist fight. I used to snap off and perhaps I will again. Uh, but nonetheless, I appreciate that the here and now is where this is happening. It's not happening back there, and it's not happening even though it uses in the future. But the future is here. Mm -hmm. So, if I may, mm -hmm. that's just something I wanted to say. Thank you. And and Noe, thank you for reading that and reminding us of that, because you'll notice that the sutra that we're reading it only just talks about a future where you'll be reborn, maybe even in heaven, right? But I like what you read, Noe, because that talks about, no, 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 right here, right now, you can have direct knowledge. We're talking nirvana, liberation, here and now. Not your next life, not even a week from now. And in many ways, what I love about Buddha Dharma is it's saying, Right here, right now is the only place it could actually happen. <laughs> so thank you, Noe, for bringing us back to that. All right. So now let's dive into Sutta number 46. This is the Maha Dhamma Samadana Sutta, the longer discourse on ways of undertaking things. I wanted to do these in the same session for a reason. I'm glad that we have enough time to, to do this. So I am going to skip a, a, few, a little bit of this, though, because it's a, it's a longer version. It's a longer sutta. But it's still in Savati, in the Jeddah's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park, so the same locale. But now it begins this way. The Buddha says, bhikkhus, for the most part, Beings have this wish, this desire, this longing. If only unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things would diminish, and wished for, desired, agreeable things would increase. Yet, although beings have this wish, this desire, and this longing, unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things increase for them and wished for desired agreeable things diminish. Now, bhikkhus, what do you think is the reason for that? Venerable Sir, the bhikkhus reply, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One, and have the Blessed One as their resort. It'd be good if the Blessed One would tell us the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikkhus will remember it. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to skip these sections because it's one of those sections where the Buddha's 
kind of talking around it for a while because it's about this idea of like people who do what they know they shouldn't do versus people who do what they should do. And it talks this way without actually saying anything for a while. It's just sort of separating skilled from unskillful people. So I'm actually going to jump all the way over to paragraph or section 14, the four ways. So this is going to kind of put us into the, the meat of the sutta. So I am skipping that, that part. But it comes back to the same idea where the Buddha in the part that I just skipped has been talking about things that are painful now, but pleasant in the future or painful and painful or pleasant and all of the language we've just gone over, but just without any content yet. Now the Buddha says, and what bhikkhus is the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain? Here bhikkhus, someone in pain and grief kills living beings. And he experiences pain and grief that having killing of beings as a condition. In pain and grief, they take what has not been given. They misconduct themselves in sexuality. They speak falsehoods, they speak maliciously, they speak harshly, they gossip, they're covetous, they have a mind of ill will, they hold wrong views, and they experience pain and grief that have wrong view and all those other things as the condition. Upon the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. This is called the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. So you'll notice that in this teaching, the Buddha has changed things around a little bit. All of these that we're going to go through, they are all focused on the 10 wholesome actions, the, the 10 kushala dharma, right? This idea of abstaining from killing, abstaining from taking what has not been given, the, the 10 things that I just listed. So this was about committing those things now. And it's painful, it's irritating. And then having committed those things leads to perdition, maybe even hell in the future. So painful, painful. And what bhikkhus is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now, but ripens in the future as pain? Here bhikkhus, someone in pleasure and joy kills living beings and they experience pleasure and joy that having killing of living beings as the condition for that joy in pleasure and joy they take what has not been given in pleasure and joy they do all the other things up to holding wrong views and they experience pleasure and joy that have wrong views as a condition. Upon the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. This is called the way of undertaking things that's pleasant now, but ripens in the future as pain. So the first person kind of maybe in a fit of rage, is upset and harms somebody, takes what has not been given, but they're upset about it. And then even after they do it, they're upset about it. And then later on, they suffer the consequences of that. And it's not good. So it's painful, painful. The second one is sadly somebody who enjoys those things. So there is pleasure for them now but not in the future. And what bhikkhus is the way of undertaking things that's painful now, but ripens in the future as pleasure? Here bhikkhus, someone in pain and grief 
abstains from killing living beings. And they experience pain and grief that have the abstention of killing as the condition. In pain and grief, they abstain from taking what has not been given. They abstain from sexual misconduct. They abstain from speaking falsehoods, from speaking maliciously, from speaking harshly, from gossiping, from being covetous, from having or not having a mind of ill will. And they hold the right view. But it's all painful for them. On the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. This is called the way of undertaking things that's painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. So same kind of deal where it's difficult for somebody to abstain from being violent or killing. It's difficult for them not to take that thing. It's difficult for them to not to gossip or all those things. So they want to gossip, oh, but they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. And it's going to be hard, but I'm not going to do it. But that, which is painful now, leads to pleasure in the future in that way. And what, bhikkhus, is the way of undertaking things that's pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure? Here, bhikkhus, someone in pleasure and joy abstains from the killing of living beings, and they experience pleasure and joy that have the abstention from killing living beings as the condition. In pleasure and joy, they abstain from taking what has not been given. In pleasure and joy, they hold the right view. And they experience pleasure and joy that have the right view as the condition. Upon the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. This is called the way of undertaking things that it's pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Now, I really want to share the, the remaining similes, though. But any questions about these four? Same thing again, of course. Everybody doing okay with those? Cool. So in classic Buddha fashion, this sutra is going, <clears throat> excuse me, this sutta will conclude with a simile. It's actually a series of similes. And this is another one where at once, well, I should read it first, but once you hear these, the, the choice is going to be pretty simple. <laughs> so now that we have our four ways of undertaking explained again, the Buddha says, Bhikkhus, suppose there were a bitter gourd mixed with poison, and a man came who wanted to live, didn't want to die who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. And the people told him, good man, this bitter gourd is mixed with poison. Drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its colorless, its, its color, smell, and taste will not agree with you. And after drinking from it, you will come to death or deadly suffering. Then he drank from it without reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, its smell and taste did not agree with him. And after drinking from it, he came to death or deadly suffering. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that's painful now and ripens in the future is pain. Now, suppose there was a bronze cup of, of a beverage possessing a good color, good smell and taste, but it was mixed with poison. And a man came who wanted to live. He didn't want to die. He wanted pleasure. He recoiled from pain. And the people told him, good man, 
This bronze cup of beverage possesses a good color, good smell and taste, but it's mixed with poison. <laughs> drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its color, smell and taste will agree with you. But after drinking from it, you will come to death or deadly suffering. Then he drank from it without reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, smell, and taste agreed with him. But after drinking from it, he came to death or deadly suffering. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that's pleasant now, but ripens in the future as pain. Now, suppose there were a fermented urine drink mixed with various medicines, and a man came sick with jaundice, and the people told him, good man, this fermented urine is mixed with various medicines. Drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its color, smell, and taste will not agree with you. But after drinking from it, you'll be well. Then he drank from it after reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, taste, and smell did not agree with him. But after drinking from it, he became well. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that it's painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. And suppose there were a curd, honey, ghee, and molasses mixed together. And a man with dysentery came, and they told him, good man, this is curd, honey, ghee, and molasses mixed together. Drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its color, smell, and taste will agree with you. And after drinking from it, you will be well. Then he drank from it after reflecting, and he did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, smell, and taste agreed with him. And after drinking from it, he became well. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that's pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Just as in autumn, in the last month of the rainy season, when the sky is clear and cloudless, the sun rises above the earth, dispelling all darkness from space with its shining and beaming radiance. So too, the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure dispels with its shining and beaming and radiance any other doctrines whatsoever of ordinary recluses and Brahmins. That's what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. <laughs> All right. So, questions, ideas, comments. We have lots of time. We've done two sutras. Don't make me do a third. Just kidding. But questions, comments, answers, ideas. Noe? Hello. Yes. Wow. <laughs> what fun. What fun having just suffered through COVID for, I don't know, the <laughs> third or fourth time. Uh, I remember the painful uh, medicine. Fortunately, I couldn't taste or smell. <laughs> so it was the entire apartment building smelled of garlic. And I ate raw garlic because it's an anti-inflammatory. But I cooked a special tea that I learned years ago of of lemon juice and 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 ginger root and garlic and cayenne pepper and and you have to drink the whole pot not you know don't put it down you got and you're sweating but in the end it just clears cleanses my body and i made a choice not to go with the pharmaceutical stuff which had been given to me but a more holistic way and it actually worked out quite nicely nice as my smell came back and I recovered from COVID and tested negative, I had to do a lot of laundry <laughs> and wash all my clothes. 
So, but I love the simile of, of the wellness that we have. It doesn't taste good, but in the end, it will it will take it will heal you in the same way that sometimes when I sit, it doesn't feel good. Mm. I'm disturbed. I'm distracted. I, I I'm I'm preoccupied. It does. I don't want to be here. I don't want to get out of bed. And then by the time the bell rings, I'm in such a better state. So I thought I'd throw that out and see if we can get some conversation going. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Robin? Oh, I'm sorry. You were going to say something, Michael. I can hold that. Thank you. I was. I just wanted to say, Noe, that I think you're a great example regarding just that, that idea of like, the that sometimes you sit down for a meditation sit and sometimes it's hard and that would be that kind of yeah that more bitter medicine that even though it's hard the result is pleasurable whereas the idea would be like you know you could imagine i'm sure you could imagine that you want to go meditate and then you're like ah oh, this is going to be hard i'll just binge watch a show <laughs> and then you binge watch the show and it is fun while it's happening. But then later on that night, you're like, eh, I don't feel well or whatever. I should have meditated. So just know a great way of bringing this kind of more to the practical level and not so much the next life or something like that. So, Robin. Thank you. It's interesting that he's... Um, positing it as pleasure and pain instead of saying well and there's something beyond that you know um and i guess it's helps us you know where we are because we're always thinking in those terms but um mm. uh, I'm, I'm surprised that you know it isn't going in saying and 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 really both of those are limiting or um not not the whole picture good good observation and i it's sort of what i was there's actually a thanks robin for bringing that up so you're right it is interesting this sort of this suttas focusing on these this polarity if you will of pleasure and pain in that way and you're right, you're, if you remember, um, and, I, and I know that you know this, but in the first sutta, you know, it did describe the jhanas and then even getting to the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasure nor pain. And we, we didn't really talk about that. So let me mention it now. You're right, Robin, that in a way, the goal Always, always a tricky word in Buddhism, but the, the goal of this is in a way a sort of transcendence of pleasure and pain. Or at least, let me say this, in the early Buddhist tradition and in the Theravada tradition and the, and the type of Buddhism represented by these suttas, the goal is a sort of transcending of both pleasure and pain. But I want to kind of really... I want to really make it clear, though, that such a state is like, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And being an arhat or a Buddha or Pratyakya Buddha or something like, so let's kind of respect that that point is this kind of trans, not a transcendent goal. But what I'm getting at, Robin, is it's not. It's not just like upaya that the Buddha talks about pleasure and like real pleasure. And what I'm getting at is, or kind of what I want to get around to in, in addressing your comment is there's a way that from a, a Buddhist point of view, or even from a Buddha point of view, like, like the way the Buddha sees the world we're all, or many of us, many of us, are very confused about pleasure and pain. And 
the Buddha spends a lot of time basically trying to point at what real pleasure is. And that's what I'm kind of often talking about in terms of the, 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 the pleasure of sovereignty. And the, I use the language of sovereignty, but it's the language of not needing anything, not being dependent upon anything. And any kind of pleasure that's dependent upon something is, of course, fleeting, temporary, conditional, and tricky because it's pleasurable when I have it, but then as soon as you take that thing away, it leads immediately to not pleasure. So that kind of sucks. So the Buddha is trying to point at how our idea or many of our ideas about pleasure is misguided. And that real pleasure is this kind of sovereignty, seclusion, or these ideas, right? But that's not the end of the story. And what I mean is, is that there's like, you know, Buddhism is sort of a multiple step process. I suppose it's an eight step process, but my point is it's like multiple steps. And so the first thing we kind of need to do is get our priorities straight regarding pleasure and pain. Like we have to not be confused about uh, mistaking any kind of pain for pleasure, I think is part of what I'm getting at. So then once we're kind of cool with that, where we're like, all right, that wasn't pleasure. That was distraction. <laughs> oh, this sovereignty or freedom or liberty, this being in the, uh, you know, free is, that's pleasant. Now we can move on to kind of step two in that way, which is eat, or it would be step four because of the fourth jhana. But the idea would be, oh, now we want to move to a spot where we're even beyond the whole pleasure pain thing. And then that's that sweet spot of equanimity. And this is what is tricky is. The, so the real tricky part about Buddhism is how. Neither pleasure nor pain is very pleasurable. <laughs> And I'm being tricky with my language there in a Buddhist way, but equanimity and actual like, because you have to kind of consider that idea that if you got into like a really juicy, pleasant first jhana, going back to work the next day is might going to be a little rough, right? It's not going to be as pleasant as that wonderful jhana. So it shows that the mind is still going to be a little uh, dichotomous or dualistic in that way. And that's where we're going to go, have to go further and transcend even that distinction of pleasure and pain so that, and now I'm talking kind of more from a Mahayana Bodhisattva point of view, but if we can kind of get beyond our neediness for pleasure and pain, that puts us in a better position to then go into uncomfortable situations to help people as bodhisattvas because we ourselves are not as affected by the situation, if you will, if that makes sense. So two things I said that I think are important there is that the equanimity that is beyond pleasure and pain is like really pleasurable. But again, we're using pleasurable in a tricky you know, way. So I would want to say that. And then I would want to point at how even pleasure and pain can be problematic in that dualistic way. So we want to kind of recognize where equanimity starts to make sense. If, if you know what I mean. Robin, more, to, more for that. Uh. Okay. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that uh, really it helps because I think, you know, it can be uh, sort of tempting to want to skip over uh, the messiness of pleasure and pain and like go right to emptiness, you know, sure. and that, and then that can be even more confusing. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Yeah, and one, you know, one last sort of, I say this a lot, but I, I think it's a, it's an appropriate moment to say it again. I'm often saying that uh, regarding this idea of pleasure, for me, the Buddha's sad that we're all having such a bad time, <laughs> like, and actually wants us to be having a more pleasurable time in that way. And it's kind of sad that we're pursuing pleasure in all of these kind of erroneous ways. So it is sort of about maximizing pleasure in a certain way. It's just, we have to be clear about what real pleasure is. Yeah. That Ray, oh, no, wait. yeah. I just, just thank you, uh, Robin, yes, and Michael. It, it, it points to the, the, to the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, the origins of suffering, the relief of suffering, the Eightfold Path. It's really just, it, it's just that. Even in pleasure, there's suffering. In, 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 in Tana, in want, craving, I crave a new iPhone, <laughs> but then I worry that I'm going to lose it. <laughs> so, and even in 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 practice, I I really want to I really want to achieve this jhana. <laughs> well, that, that's just you wanting. That's just me wanting. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, ah, oh, finding that equanimity. Like there is no, it's the there neither here nor there. It's just the being here. So beautifully simple and so incredibly complicated for me. <laughs> You said it, Noe. So beautiful, so simple, yet so complicated. It's really, you know, I, this has for me personally been coming up a lot. I think the last couple of weeks, this, like the remarkable simplicity of this teaching and its complexity, like that it's sort of both at the same time in such an interesting way. It's been coming up mainly, you know, around this essential teaching of no self that it's so simple and yet so subtle and tricky in that way. And I mean, that's just one of many of these Buddhist teachings. It's like so simple, but once you really start practicing, you, what you really begin to notice, or what I have really started noticing is it's one thing it's one thing, let's say, if you're just quick to being angry, let's say, and then that's just sort of what happens and you're kind of a hot-headed person or what have you. But what's really interesting is when you decide that you don't want to be that way anymore, that you've, you've realized like, oh, you know, that's like my, it's not helping my friends. It's not helping my family. It's not helping me. And then when you really decide to stop and then you start noticing the habits Meaning you start to notice, oh my gosh, this is wired deep in me to the point where you no longer even want to be doing these things, but you find yourself kind of out of either, again, habit or out of conditioning, just going to those places. That's when the practice really starts because then you're, you're kind of, you know, at odds with yourself in that way or at least you're at odds with the samskara, with the conditioning in that sense, where you're recognizing, oh my gosh, this is, this is deep. But then you also then realize, oh, but that's what, how the practice works then, which is if I stop and notice, it breaks the cycle. But if I just go along with it, which happens a lot, then if you take, for example, anger, you realize, oh, I'm just practicing being angry. And you can get really good at it. <laughs> like, like so good that you can get angry at anything and you can get angry really quickly. Ooh, and you could stay angry for weeks, you know? These are all ways of being very good at anger. Like, the, and it takes practice. <laughs> it takes practice to hold a grudge for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that way it doesn't just happen the first time so we begin to notice like oh 
This is a conditioned thing that's always being conditioned by every action. Oh, I should either watch what I do or I should steer this baby in a better direction. So, yeah, Noe. I just came to mind. This is against the stream. Indeed. That's all. It's just, the oh, not. Yeah. The stream is, is habits, it's... conditioning, a lot of things is the stream that's going that way. And to put your foot in the stream and start going the other way, it's no small task. It really, It's really what it blows my mind in many ways about Buddhism, that it's this really wild tradition that's actually working against the grain, against the stream of of evolutionary biology that's huge where most of life is flowing right along with that process of evolutionary biology in that way which of course if you look around can be a little scary as far as all creatures really just looking out for their own self-preservation right so this movement of a buddha or a bodhisattva just this movement against self-interest like meaning against exclusive self-interest right and this kind of opening up and then if you really start to like take the buddha seriously it's opening up to all sentient beings and I want to kind of just repeat what I just said in that in a different way. You know, the, the starting point or what Buddhism presumes is the starting point is an incredibly egocentric, myopic, self-interested, shelled ego that is only concerned about their own pleasure, period. <laughs> and Buddhism is about cracking open that shell, moving outwards to include not just your family, not just your friends, not just your neighbors, not just your city fellow citizens, your country, but all sentient beings. That's a huge shift in the mind in that way. And so it's like, again, no small task to go against potentially, you know, millions of years of evolutionary biology and a whole, you know, culture and society that's predicated on that yeah it's superhuman truly in that way to to go against the stream so i give you all credit out there if you're swimming against the stream any other thoughts great thoughts comments ideas cool then we can call it a, an evening two sutures down that's not a bad that's not a bad session um and i actually i kind of expected this to be a shorter night even though we were going to do the both because the the teachings are pretty simple one in that way just you know these four ideas and it really again is i think the the upaya of both of these sutras is to make the choice obvious <laughs> Right. Especially with that last simile of the four drinks. If you've got one drink that tastes like honey and it's going to make you better. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, everybody. That'll be it for tonight's Dharma Doors. Thanks for being here.